distinctions. But uh, my interest in, in risk management is broader than just the world of projects. And hopefully you'll see that uh, during this presentation. But I am essentially a practitioner, not an academic or a theoretical person. Ideas are important, but they have to work in practice. Um, and so all the things I'm going to share with you today are proven, uh, proven ideas that actually work in practice. And I hope they'll work for you if you'll just perhaps try expanding your thinking and then expanding your practice. So we're talking today about delivering strategic advantage through integrated risk management. And that immediately raises at least two questions. What do we mean by strategic advantage? And what do I mean by integrated risk management? And then the third question, once we've made our definitions, is to see how those two link together, how integrated risk management will deliver strategic advantage. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll know where you fit in as a project management specialist, um, a project management practitioner in the strategic picture of your organization. So let's start with strategic advantage. Why do we want strategic advantage? We want strategic advantage in order to make sure that we perform well, but essentially advantage is about beating the competition. We want our organization to be leading right at the front of the field, be doing, to be doing the best that we can, but also to do better than the competition. And we get strategic advantage by being smarter, faster, cheaper, better, or different, which are all words that describe innovation. So strategic advantage is about doing the best we can in the most effective and efficient way. And the question here in this presentation is how to get smarter, faster, cheaper, better, different, and really specifically, can risk management help us? And if so, how? So let's think a little bit more about strategic advantage and that link between risk management and strategic advantage. I'd like to suggest to you that all organizations can be viewed as a hierarchy of objectives. So what we do is we start at the top with strategic objectives, which define our mission and our vision. This is what our organization exists for. This is why we are here. And then we break down those high level strategic objectives into lower level objectives, into intermediate objectives that describe portfolio uh, objectives and program objectives and also functional and technical objectives. And then below those intermediate levels, we continue to decompose our objectives through the organization until we get to the lowest level, the level of actually doing something, which is the level of projects and operations. And so we have a hierarchy of objectives where we start at the top with our strategy and our vision. We break that down through the organization and we end up at the lowest level with detailed objectives, which explain how we're going to fulfill our high level strategic objectives. In order to be effective, an organization needs to have objectives throughout the organization which are coherent, which make sense when taken together, and which are aligned. In other words, um, the, the ones below make sense in terms of the ones above them. So everything is, is lined up and, and contributes together. And that's demonstrated by the way that we define our objectives. Objectives are coherent because they're defined top down. We start with the strategy and we say, how are we going to achieve our strategy? And we're going to achieve our strategy through a number of portfolio level uh, objectives and also functions. And then the next question is, well, how are we going to achieve our portfolio objectives? And we achieve our portfolio objectives by going one level down in terms of programs and sub portfolios. Then the question is, well, how do we achieve those? And ultimately, we get to the bottom level that says we're going to achieve things by launching projects and by running operations. And then we fulfill our objectives bottom up. So we do our projects, we execute our operations, and through doing projects and, and operations, we achieve not only project objectives, but we contribute to the fulfillment of our program objectives. And as we fulfill our programs, we also then fulfill our portfolio objectives and ultimately our strategic objectives. So we should see in an organization, if we look at the objective hierarchy of the organization, a set of objectives which are defined top down, but as we execute our projects and operations at the bottom level, we're ultimately contributing to the achievement of our strategic top level objectives. So when we think about what a business is for, there's a number of possible answers. And if I was to ask you, if I was live in the room with you, I would ask for your suggestions. A lot of us, when we think about what businesses exist for, would come up with words like this, 
we exist to create deliverables or products and services that people want and need and to deliver benefits. But there's another set of answers to the question, what is business for, which might have these sorts of answers. A business exists to generate profit for its stakeholders, uh, or maybe its shareholders who are a subset of the stakeholders. A business exists in order to learn how to do this particular type of business better. We should be a learning organization and we're executing our business in order to learn how to do it better. The business exists to generate experience which we can benefit from in the future. We've got higher level uh, purposes for our business, not just creating deliverables, products and services. So what we see is that businesses have two key purposes. There's a set of tactical purposes, which we might summarize as creating deliverables, products and services that deliver benefits to customers. But we also have a set of strategic objectives, or st strategic purposes, which are contributing to achieving the broader business objectives. And clearly it's important that the tactical and strategic are coherent and aligned, as we've seen. But where do projects fit into this picture? Projects create deliverables, and a successful project creates the deliverables which are within its scope. But projects also contribute to programs, and programs don't deliver deliverables, programs create outcomes. And programs contribute to portfolios which deliver benefits, and those benefits in turn contribute to the execution of strategy and fulfilling our vision. So we'll see that if our objectives in our organization are coherent and aligned, if our projects are successful, ultimately we're leading to a strategic success for our business or our organization, execution of the vision. So within this structure, where does risk management contribute? Why do we do risk management in our projects? Project risk management is aimed to give us more successful projects to improve our chances of achieving our project objectives, to make sure that we work as efficiently and effectively as possible, that we minimize our disruptions, that we get to the end of the project in the best possible way. So effective project risk management should lead to more successful projects. And because of the hierarchy that we've looked at, more successful projects will give us more successful programs, more successful portfolios, and yes, you guessed it, a more successful strategy which we might summarize to say, well, effective risk management in our projects will ultimately lead to more successful strategy. Risk management directly contributes to strategic success. Risk management of projects helps us to achieve our strategic, strategic vision because of this linkage, this coherence and alignment between the objectives in our organization. So that's why risk management is important in terms of achieving strategic advantage. But our projects and businesses can only deliver full value if we understand and manage risk properly. If we don't really understand risk, and if our management of risk is not effective, then, uh, or rather, if there's a link between those two things. If we don't properly understand risk, then we won't be able to manage it effectively. I really messed that whole thing up, didn't I? I'll say it one more time just so it's clear. A limited concept of risk will lead to ineffective management of risk. If we clearly understand what risk is, then we can manage it properly. If we don't understand what risk is, then we won't be able to manage it properly. So I've shown here a picture of a horse with, with uh, blinders on, only able to look in a particular direction with a limited field of vision. There are things that the horse can't see and therefore can't respond to. Very often our view of risk is limited. We are like the horse with the blinders on. We have a view of what we think risk is and we try and manage those things that we think are risks. But there are other things that might be outside of our field of vision that we're not looking at that we don't include in our view of risk, if we have a limited concept of risk, then there are risks that we won't be managing. And so our, effect, our, our management of risk will be ineffective. And that also has an effect through the hierarchy. If effective management of risk in our projects helps us to achieve strategic goals, ineffective management, management of risk in our projects will mean that we're not going to be able to contribute to achieving those strategic goals, to delivering strategic advantage. So it's really important how we think about risk 
because how we think affects how we act. If we think wrong about risk, we won't manage it effectively. So what should we be thinking about risk management? Let's go back to basics fairly quickly. I, I guess you will have covered some of these things previously with Steve and earlier on in the course, but let's just have a refresher on what risk management is about and start at the beginning. What do we mean by risk? I've got some images coming up on the screen that might reflect how you think about risk. Risk is some big, ugly thing that faces us, which is threatening to kind of squash us, make our life really difficult. Risk is, uh, you know, we're a bit of a target and risk is aiming straight for us and, and, and it's quite a dangerous and threatening position that it puts us in. Or the bottom picture, risk is something that's lurking out there just waiting to get us. That might be what you think about risk. But I'm here to tell you that is a limited concept of risk. That's not the right way to think about risk. So let me just make sure that we're all thinking on the same page, thinking with the same concept of what we mean by risk. I'm, not, I'm going to start with this simple question. Is risk the same as uncertainty? And hopefully you're all shouting, no, no, at your screen. At least you should be. Risk is not the same as uncertainty. All risks are uncertain, but not all uncertainties are risks. If you think about how many uncertainties in, there are in the world, there are billions. I mean, we don't know. There's, there's, there's lots and lots and lots. How many risks do you have in your risk register? Certainly not billions. Risk is a subset of uncertainty. But how do we know which subset out of all the billions of uncertainties in the world, which ones do we need to capture and write down in our risk register and think about and respond to and communicate about? Which uncertainties are risks? How do we determine that subset? And I would like to give you three words which help us to act as a filter on that huge world of uncertainty to decide which uncertainties are risks. And it's these three words. Risk is uncertainty that matters. Because most of the uncertainties in the world don't matter. All those billions of things that might or might not happen. Is it going to rain in, in Kazakhstan? You know, what's the exchange rate between the ruble and the yen going to be in 2030? You know, who cares? We don't know, but it doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? It doesn't matter because even if it happened, it wouldn't affect our objectives. Objectives define what matter. Objectives are what is at risk in our projects, our programs, our portfolios and in our organisation. So objectives are really, really important and risks are defined in relation to objectives. So objectives give us that filter in that huge world of uncertainty to decide which uncertainties matter. The answer is the uncertainties that could affect our objectives. So that's why I started with a hierarchy of objectives and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So risk is uncertainty that matters because it, because it can affect our objectives. But let's think a little bit more about that effect dimension. Uh, risk has two dimensions, the uncertainty dimension, we might call that probability or likelihood or frequency or chance. It's the, 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 the degree to which the thing might or might not happen. The other dimension, if risk is uncertainty that matters and it matters because it affects our objectives, the question is, well, how much might it affect our objectives? So the size of the effect on objectives, we would call that impact or consequence or effect or, or some similar word. In the project management world, we generally speak about probability and impact, but you could say likelihood and consequence. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is there are two dimensions. And there's another important thing about the impact dimension, which is illustrated by this silly picture I found on the internet of the mouse. The mouse is a project manager, just like you and me. And the mouse is facing an uncertain situation but he's a good project manager. He's a risk managing mouse. He's spotted that there are uncertainties that matter in this situation that he's facing and he's preparing to tackle them. So you'll see he's spotted there's a trap. He could be killed or injured. And so he's going very, very carefully and he's got his helmet on. When we're running projects, there are traps in the project, things that could kill us, that could, well, kill the project at least, uh, waste time, waste money, destroy performance, destroy value, maybe even injure people. And we need to spot those things, prepare to protect ourselves and go very carefully. 
But there's another uncertainty in this situation that the mouse is really focused on, an uncertainty that matters. It's not just the trap, it's also the cheese. Can I get this cheese off the trap and, and, and eat it and grow and be strong and healthy and, and continue to survive? That's uncertain, but the mouse needs to manage that uncertainty. It's an uncertainty that matters. And in fact, he has to manage the uncertainty of getting the cheese at the same time as managing the uncertainty of not springing the trap. And that's why he's a project manager. Because in project management, we have two, uh, two um, groups of uncertainties that we need to manage. We have traps, things that could be dangerous and hurt us if they happen, and we must avoid those things, protect ourselves and go very carefully. But we also have things that we want out of the project, which are also uncertain. We call those things benefits or value, or products and services, or deliverables. And getting those things out of the project is uncertain. That's why we need project management. And the mouse has to manage both the traps and the cheese at the same time. If he gets the cheese out, but he's killed, he's failed. And if we create value and send deliver, but we've, we're, we're late and we're overspent and we've damaged our reputation, that's no good. Or we could, he could not spring the trap, but he doesn't get the cheese, he's failed. If we're on time, on, that, on um, a budget, and everything is fine, but we don't deliver any value, we failed as project managers. We have to manage both types of uncertainty at the same time. And of course, we have to do that in the best possible way. And sometimes there are more efficient and effective ways of getting the cheese out of the trap without springing it. The point here is that there are two types of impacts that matter. We're not only interested in uncertainties that could hurt us if they happened, uncertainties that could destroy value and waste time. We're also interested in uncertainties that could help us. We want to maximize the uncertainties that could help us and take advantage of them at the same time as minimizing the uncertainties that could hurt us and stop them happening. And that's the point of risk management. Risk management is about tackling two types of uncertainties, preventing potential, preventing potential problems, of course, we need to stop things going wrong. But we also need to find potential benefits and grab them and help things go right. Which means that risk management has two areas of interest, not just threats, but also opportunities. Uncertainties that matter because they could help us are as important as uncertainties that matter because they could hurt us. So we need to be looking for the uncertainties that could save time, save money, enhance performance, increase value, as well as the uncertainties that could waste time, waste money and destroy performance. Both of those things matter, both need to be managed. So are those both in scope for risk management? Let's just look at the definition of risk uh, that PMI give us, for example, this is the definition of risk from the PMI lexicon. The latest version happens to be 2017 linked to the sixth edition of the PMBOK guide. And so here we have a definition that links uncertainty with objectives, as we've seen. A risk is an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs affects an objective. But there's a gap here on the screen because PMI has added three words into the definition between the word has a, <coughs> has a, excuse me, has a and effect. What kind of effect? PMI knows about the mouse. PMI knows about cheese as well as traps. PMI has added these words. Risk is an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs has a positive or negative effect on objectives. PMI says that risk includes both opportunities and threats. Opportunities and threats are both uncertainties that matter. They might not happen, but if they do happen, they can affect our outcomes. And it's not just PMI. It's also included in the ISO standard. It's included in the APM standard, the IPMA standard, the European standard, the Chinese standard, the Japanese standard. Everybody agrees that risk includes both opportunities and threats. And those are in scope for the management of risk in our projects, programs, portfolios and businesses. So that's a quick primer, a quick basic rundown 
what risk management is about. Risk management gives us a forward looking radar that scans the future, that says what's out there coming my way, which uncertainties do I care about? Which are the uncertainties that matter, that could hit me hard and hurt, or that could hit me and help me, so I can steer away from the bad ones and towards the good ones. And it's giving us early warning so we can respond proactively in advance. Now, what does all this have to do with strategic management? Let's just remind ourselves of the risk management process. The risk management process is basically asking and answering six questions. The first question is about objectives. What am I trying to do? Once I know my objectives, the next question is, well, what could affect me? And we call that risk identification. We'll get a long list of things that could affect us achieving our objectives, so we need to prioritise them, work out which ones are most important. And once we know the important ones, we need to know what we could do about them. And once we know what we could do, well, we have to do it and then find out if it worked and then see what changed. And each of these six questions corresponds to one step in the risk management process. So this process is very similar to what you'll find in the PIMBOK guide, slightly different words in some places, but effectively what we're saying is that the defining objectives or risk management planning step is about deciding what we're trying to achieve. Then we identify risks and analyze them. That's what could affect us and which are the big ones. We plan our responses and we implement them. What could we do and we do it. Then we monitor and review, and that's about deciding if our response has worked and seeing what's changed. And we have a cycle, which is the risk management process. So here we have a basic primer on risk, uncertainty that matters, risk management, making sure that we minimize threats, maximize opportunities, and a simple risk process which answers basic questions. Now, what's integrated risk management? What I want to talk about in the rest of this presentation is three types of integration. I want to talk about in integration within the risk management process, so we have an integrated risk process. I want to talk about integration of risk management as a whole within pro project management. And then I want to show how integrated project risk management needs to be integrated within the rest of the business. So internal, horizontal and vertical. And we'll cover these quite briefly to make sure that we leave some time for questions and discussion at the end. So what do I mean by internal integration? Well, I've just raised a, an idea that hopefully you're familiar with, but maybe you might not be. And that is that risk management includes both threats and opportunities. And we need to have an integrated risk process that deals with both. In some organisations, we don't think about positive risks at all. We, we don't consider opportunities in a structured way in any sense. In other organisations, we might consider opportunities, but outside of the risk process. And risk management is about managing potential bad things only. What PMI says and what other standards say is that risk management should manage all risks in an integrated single risk process. And the risk process should deal with both threats and opportunities at the same time in an integrated way. Now, out of this, um, this a generic risk management process, there are three areas where we might need to particularly consider changing the process to take care of opportunities, where we need to pay particular attention in order to include opportunities to have an integrated risk process that deals with both threats and opportunities. And it's these three areas, identification, assessment or analysis, and response planning. Now, we don't have a lot of time to go into all the details. You could just look in the PIMBOK guide or the ISO standard or one of my books or any one of a, of a myriad places. But let's just think about identification. When we know what our objectives are, if we want an integrated risk process, we're not just asking what might hurt us. We're also thinking about what might help us to identify opportunities. We're looking for upside risks, risks that if they occurred would save time, save money, enhance performance, help us work faster, smarter, cheaper. And we need to do that in a, in a structured way, perhaps using a risk breakdown structure, having, having opportunity workshops as well as threat workshops, thinking about SWOT analysis, where the O for SWOT analysis is opportunities and the T is threats and looking for them in an integrated way. 
we ought to consider uh, a, a structured uh, opportunity identification as part of an integrated risk process. Once we've found some opportunities, we need to work out which are the most important. And for opportunities, that means which are the best ones. For threats, we're considering probability and impact. The high probability, high impact threats are really, really bad. They're likely to happen. They're really likely to hurt. What we want to do when we're prioritizing opportunities is also to look for high probability, high impact. They're likely to happen, but they're really good. So we want to find the best possible opportunities, but we do it in the same way, in an integrated way, considering probability and impact and using a heat map or a probability impact matrix in exactly the same way. But we need to do it in an integrated way. And once we've identified some upside risks, some opportunities and found the best ones, then clearly we need to plan some responses and think about how we make the opportunities actually happen. How can we capture or exploit opportunities? How can we improve them or enhance them? How can we get somebody else to help us to share the opportunity? Or are they just opportunities that we have to accept and wait and see? So like we have four responses for threats, we have avoid, transfer, mitigate, and accept. We also have four, four responses for opportunities. Can we exploit, which is an aggressive response like avoidance? Can we share an opportunity which is involving other people like, like threat transfer? Can we enhance the opportunity, make it bigger, like we try and make a threat smaller with mitigation? And can we just accept, are there some opportunities we just accept uh, because we can't do anything more about them proactively, like we accept threats? So we have a similar set of opportunity response strategies, and we think about them and plan for them in an integrated process alongside responding to our threats. So what we're looking for is an integrated risk process, which in one single hit, one single pass, aims to minimize threats, maximize opportunities, and through that, optimize achievement of our objectives. So um, what we're looking for is a way of integrating the treatment of all types of risk within a single risk management process. Now, hopefully that isn't a great surprise to you because that is the standard recommendation of PMI and ISO and all the other standards that I mentioned. But if you haven't been managing risk in this way, this is a place to start. This is a, a quick win. This is easy to do because the process for ma managing opportunities is the same as the process for managing threats. All you have to do is think positive instead of negative. Think about upside risks as well as downside risks. Think about finding the best ones alongside the worst ones. Think about making opportunities happen alongside making threats not happen. It's the same process, it's just with a positive spin alongside the negative spin. And it's easy to implement. And if you have any questions or problems with that, well, let's talk about that a little bit later. So that's the first type of integration, internal integration within the risk management process, dealing with all kinds of risks, including both upside opportunities and downside threats. Easy. We should do that. We can't achieve strategic objectives unless we have successful projects. Our projects won't be successful unless we maximize opportunities alongside minimizing threats. Now, let's think about our second type of integration. I said internal, which is threats and opportunities together in the process. The second type is horizontal, thinking about how risk management fits with other project management processes. Now, you're on a course that studies project management. You should be familiar with all of the different project management processes that we need to follow, standard project management. Have you thought about why we do standard project management processes? Why do you plan? Why do you estimate? Why do you um, have uh, motivational team meetings? Why do you communicate? Why do you do stakeholder management? What are these things for? I'd like to suggest to you that every project management process has the purpose of managing risk. Well, that might surprise you. I am the risk doctor. So obviously for me, risk is the world. Everything is about risk. But actually, I hope you'll see that this is, this is actually true. The reason we do scheduling, oh, sorry, scheduling, um, I'm from England. 
So I went to a shul, not a school. No, hang on. The reason we do scheduling is to address time risk, to make sure that we actually can get from the beginning to the end within the allocated time. What is the critical path? Where do we need to pay attention in order to stay on time? What's the earliest finish dates and the latest finish dates? And where do we plan to be in between? We do scheduling in order to address the uncertainties around the time timeline of the project. Why do we do estimating and budgeting? We do estimating and budgeting to find out how much our project is going to cost. Which are the most expensive elements? Which are the cheapest elements? Where is there, there the most potential variation? Where do we need to be particularly careful? And so we estimate in order to reduce cost risk. The work breakdown structure is to make sure we know what's in the project and what's not in the project. So we're reducing scope uncertainty. We plan our resources to look at resource uncertainty. We do reporting in order to, in order to manage the risks associated with stakeholder engagement and so on. Every project management process aims to reduce risk. That's what it's for, which is fine, uh, except we're, we're then left with another question. What's risk management for? If all our project management processes are there to handle types of risk, why do we need to do risk management? The problem is that standard operating procedures within our organization, our standard project management processes, are about tackling the common risks, the sorts of risks that come up on all or most of our projects, the sorts of risks that we handle routinely in our projects. And we do uh, project scheduling and estimating and planning and so on in order to tackle the sorts of risks that our business is designed to take. So it's like um, if you were a, a rock climber, there, there is no risk of you falling off the rock, off the cliff face, because that's why you have the, the, the um, crampons and you have the, pit, the, the, the bits that you hammer into the, I've lost all my terminology, uh, the bits that you hammer into the rock and you have the ropes and you have all the safety harnesses and everything else in order to manage the common risks. The risk you're not expecting, the real risk to a, a, um, a rock climber is an unexpected wind or something falling from above that you hadn't foreseen or one of the other climbers making a silly mistake. Standard processes are tackling the common risks. So for you as a practitioner in that area, there are no risks. Three weeks ago, I jumped out of an airplane, did a skydive uh, tandem, strapped to somebody else, 15,000 feet, three miles in the air, jumped out 120 miles an hour, trusting the guy behind to pull the parachute because he didn't want to die either. And somebody said to me, that was hugely risky. And I said, in my mind, zero risk. Why is there zero risk of jumping out of an airplane with a parachute and tied to another guy? Because that other guy is an expert because he knows all of the standard things that could go wrong and has thought about them in advance and reduced them to zero. There's no chance of me hitting the ground and actually ending up in, you know, in a, in a mess. So um, standard risks that are associated with our kinds of business are dealt with through standard project management processes. So why do we need risk management? Well, the truth is there are other risks which are not standard, like the, um, the gust of wind for the, for the rock climber or somebody falling off a, a higher than him. Risk management is about uncovering and tackling uncommon risks, the risks that are not covered in our standard project management processes, the risks that no one has thought of before, the ones where it's nobody's job to tackle them, the ones that otherwise would be missed. What we need to do is to find all of the uncertainties that matter. People before us on similar projects have found a lot of the uncertainties that matter that are routine for our kind of projects, and they've designed project management processes to deal with them. Risk management is about thinking outside the box, about thinking about different things that nobody has previously considered and saying, in addition to our standard kinds of uncertainties that we know how to manage, there's this. What are we going to do about that? Oh, gosh, we need to do the risk process and think about how important it is and how we need to respond and then take that, that action and see if it worked. So project management processes address our standard business as usual risks. Risk management is there to address the risk, which means that risk management needs to be integrated with the rest of project management. 
What we need to do is to allow the project management processes to deal with our standard routine, um, ev everyday risks that happen on all our projects. That's why we do standard project management. And then risk management needs to be part of that process, which takes looks for the unusual risks and then fits those into the way that we're managing this project. That means that we need to use the results of the risk process to inform the rest of the way that we manage the project. If we find time critical risks, risks that can affect our project schedule, then we need to make sure those are built into or fed into the scheduling process. So yes, you've thought about the, the dependencies and about the resource shortages, you've done your resource limited uh, project scheduling, all of those things. Now we found that there's a possibility of something else that might happen that we weren't thinking of, one of our key suppliers goes out of business or we find there's a shortage of a key, res a, a, a key um, uh, resource, uh, raw material. We need to play that into our project schedule in addition to the standard things that we've thought about. Cost risks need to be taken care of in our contingency. We need to recognize our risky stakeholders and communicate carefully to them in addition to our standard stakeholder engagement plan and so on. We need to make sure that we're using the results of risk, the risk process, which have identified uncommon specific risks that could affect this project and play those into the way that we're managing this project. And of course, we have to remember that not all risks are bad. We were talking about integrating opportunities and threats in a common process. As we're thinking about which risks we take account of when we're managing the project, that includes the upside ones. We found ways that we might save time in our project schedule or save money in our project budget. And we need to play those into the way that we manage this project as well. So integrating uh, horizontally is about taking account of risk in our standard project management processes, not just letting risk management be a thing off on the side in a silo done by the risk, risk manager or the risk champion or the risk specialist, but taking account of the results of the risk process and using that in the way that we execute the project. So let's have a look at the third level of integration. We've talked about internal integration, dealing with threats and opportunities together. We've talked about horizontal integration so that risk management in this project feeds into the other project management processes. Now I want to talk about vertical integration where we think about how risk management of our project relates to other levels of the organization. Now, well, I've shown you again this picture of the organization as a hierarchy of objectives. And what we have to recognize is that if risk affects objectives, then we also have a hierarchy of risk. So we find that project risks are uncertainties that if they occur could affect project objectives. Program risks are uncertainties that if they occur affect program objectives. And strategic risks are uncertainties that if they occur affect strategic objectives. For every level of objectives, we have a level of risk. Risk is uncertainty that affects objectives. So who's gonna manage those risks? The organization could also be described as a hierarchy of responsibilities. So we have different levels of leadership and management and accountability. Top leaders are responsible for delivering strategic objectives. So our board or our exco directors, senior managers, executives are responsible for delivering strategic objectives. Strategic risks are uncertainties that affect strategic objectives. So strategic leaders need to manage strategic risks in order to deliver strategic objectives. Middle management are responsible for, for delivering intermediate objectives. So we would have a program manager who's responsible for delivering program objectives, which means they need to manage program risk. And similarly for us as project management practitioners, our responsibility is to deliver project objectives which are affected by project risks. So project managers own the project risk management process. So you'll see that as we have a hierarchy of objectives, we also have a hierarchy of risk and a hierarchy of accountability or risk ownership. Now, what does that mean? What we ought to do in order to make it work well is to make sure that our risk management is coherent and aligned 
in the same way that the objectives are and hopefully in the same way that our organization is. So we need to have a linkage between these levels of risk management, between the project risk management, the operational risk management, program and portfolio risk management, and strategic risk management. We need to make sure that we can link these things together and manage them in a coherent and aligned way. And that's what we call enterprise risk management or ERM. You might have heard the term. So ERM is to make sure that we have a common risk language and a common risk process supported by common infrastructure with common reporting to our stakeholders so that all of our risk management at every level of the organization is coherent and aligned just as our objectives are coherent and aligned. And what that enables us to do is to pass risks between the levels to make sure that the risk is managed at the appropriate level. So project risk managers manage project risk. We don't manage strategic risk. That's the responsibility of our strategic level leadership. If we find when we're running a project an uncertainty that could affect a strategic objective, we can escalate that to the level at which it would affect. So uh, a risk needs to be managed at the, at the level of the objective. And so we can escalate or delegate risks to make sure that they get managed at the appropriate level. So vertical risk alignment or risk integration is making sure that we have a common approach to managing risk throughout the organization with a common language and process and so on. And that we pass risks up and down the organization to make sure that they're managed at the appropriate level. And that's what we call enterprise risk management. OK, well, I think I've probably um, said enough to at least get you thinking, hopefully has some, some questions uh, bubbling up. So let me wrap up with a few final thoughts and just summarize what we've talked about so far. We've talked about three different types of integration, internal integration within the risk process, dealing with threats and opportunities in a common way, so that the single risk process manages all of the risks in an integrated fashion. We've talked about horizontal integration. So risk management isn't done off on the side, but it fits into our other project management processes where standard processes deal with standard risks and risk management identifies the uncommon special different types of risk that could affect this project. And we feed that into management of the project. So we're feeding into our scheduling and estimating and planning and reporting and communication and so on. All of those things are risk informed. That's horizontal integration. And finally, we've talked about vertical integration through an enterprise wide risk management process or enterprise risk management structure where we're, we're making sure that risk is managed across all levels of the business in a common way. Why do we need to do this? Why should we bother? How does this help us achieve strategic advantage? Well, first of all, we need to see that there are benefits of each of these three types of integration. First of all, what are the advantages in having a common process for managing threats and opportunities? The first is simple efficiency. You don't need a separate process to manage opportunities. You just fit it into the same process we've always been using for managing threats. A single process deals with both types of uncertainty. So we get two for the price of one. Run the, run the risk process, maximize opportunities as well as minimizing threats. And that's very motivating for our project teams to have a structured way of, of finding how to work faster, smarter, cheaper, to have a, a structured way of finding out how to save time and save money. Everybody wants to do that. It also helps us to be creative and innovative and look for the best possible ways, different ways, unusual ways, diff, uh, special ways on this project of getting to our project goals in the best possible way. It means that we miss fewer opportunities. So many projects have opportunities that just pass them by and you see them too late in the rear view mirror where you could have captured them to help you. We're actually seeing them coming in advance and being proactive, missing opportunities, creating more benefits and ultimately making our projects more successful. So there are huge advantages to the project in having an internally integrated risk process that deals with both upside and downside risks in a single process. What are the advantages of horizontal integration, making sure that risk management fits in with the rest of the project? Well, one thing is it makes it, 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 um, 
it requires us to have good project management to have good scheduling and good estimating and good stakeholder management and good resource planning and good communication to deal with the standard risks uh, we would be in trouble if our project management wasn't good but then we're adding value to that by saying risk management will look at the extra things the things that you hadn't considered in your standard process so it adds value to standard project management make sure that our project schedule is risk informed and is, is resilient to uncertainty making sure that our, our cost estimates have the right level of contingency it helps risk management to get out of the silo not just be in that little box on the side and make sure it's useful and then uses the results of the risk process in a proactive way demonstrating that risk management is adding value and ultimately makes our projects perform more effectively and as a little sideline, if you are a risk specialist, it's quite satisfying to see how your work is helping the rest of the project to be more successful. There's nothing worse than being a risk specialist stuck in the office doing this sort of risk thing and nobody cares and nobody's taking any notice. And it's actually quite satisfying if you come up with some risks that could really affect the project and you can pass that into the rest of the project team to make everybody's life easier and to make, make the project more successful. So job satisfaction for the risk team is another advantage. And finally, what's the advantage in vertical integration, using enterprise risk management to manage risk consistently at all levels of the organization? First of all, it helps us to talk about risk. Risk is not just a technical thing, not just a thing for the project people or for the risk specialists. We all have a common language to communicate about risk. It makes sure that risk is managed at the right level, at every level within the organization, with clear ownership, understanding that the person who owns the objectives also owns the risks. It helps us to understand how our project contributes to achievement of strategic goals because we can see the connection through the risks. It makes sure that we're transferring experience from one project to another, from multiple projects to the program, from programs and portfolios to the executive team. And it makes sure that we can learn lessons from the past because we have a structured way of capturing those lessons across the organization. So there are huge advantages in having an integrated approach to risk management. In order to make it work, what we need to do is to make sure we have a, a aligned objectives, because without aligned objectives, the whole thing falls apart. That's a different question. It's not really a risk question. It's more an organizational question, but it is an important question. It's a prerequisite to getting risk management effective is to have effectively defined objectives. Once we've got aligned objectives, we need to have internal integration by broadening our process, including opportunities. We need to have horizontal, um, horizontal integration by using risk information to shape our project decisions. And finally, we need to make sure that we have coherent risk management across the organization through an enterprise risk management approach. So to answer the, the, the original question, how does integrated risk management deliver strategic advantage? We've shown that there are three types of integration, internal, horizontal, and vertical. By dealing with both threats and opportunities and using that information to inform our project decisions, we end up with an optimal project delivery. We optimize our chances of achieving our projects, which means we'll be working in the fastest, smartest, cheapest, most effective way, and probably doing that better than the competition. So optimal project delivery comes from internal and horizontal integration within the project. And vertical integration makes sure that we have coherent risk management across the organization as a whole, which makes sure that we're minimizing our risk, maximizing our, our opportunities uh, in the best possible way for the whole organization. And if you put those two things together, optimal project delivery within a coherent and aligned risk framework, that's going to make sure that our organization is running at, at peak efficiency with maximum performance, delivering all the benefits that we could through our projects, programs, portfolios, and delivering strategic vision. That's how it works. So let me just hand over to you with some questions. I guess you're going to ask me questions, but I'll ask you questions first. Could you do this? Hopefully you'll see that it makes sense, that it's a structured way of using risk management to help us, not just in our projects, not just in, in our programs, but across the whole organization. Could you do it? 
Hopefully you'll have seen that these things are quite simple and straightforward, existing techniques, existing processes and guidelines. Some things might be difficult, so what are they and how can you overcome those things? What would happen if you weren't doing this, if you just carried on doing risk management as you currently do? And what would happen if you did do it like this? The most important question, are you going to change your practice? Change your thinking, change your practice. Think about risk in the right way. Integrate the way you, risk, you manage risk within the process, within the project and across the organisation. I recommend it. It will make a huge difference and I hope you'll give it a try. Well, that's all I want to say. Um, I'm happy to hand over for questions. Um, I have got my contact details are here and Steve will have um, all the slides available too, which we'll pass out to you uh, as a handout. But um, that's all I want to say. So I'm going to hand back to you, stop sharing my slides and, um, and be ready for questions.